Welcome to Property Now, where we are on a mission to make you the property pro in your group chat. In today's episode, me and the guys discuss the market outlook for first home buyers in 2024. We unpack some of the challenges that first home buyers have been facing and will continue to face. Um, we share an example of a first home buyer story that we saw online this week. And we end with some tangible solutions and actions that first home buyers can take to increase their chances of making 2024 the year that they get into property. We really hope you enjoy today's episode. Make sure you subscribe and follow Property Now. <music> All right, guys, welcome back. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. From great your to be back. slightly extended holiday. Yes, it's great. I've got a fantastic team. You do. It's, uh, it's been great. Great to be back, though. Yeah. Yeah, we missed you last week. And for anyone who is um, listening, not watching, Michael is not here. He's away this week. Um, so we'll, we'll push on without him. Next week, we're back to a full squad. Full squad. Which is great. He's away getting a tan too, I yes. assume. He is jealous. We'll have to go like sit out in the sun, Jace. Um, or spray tan. That's safer. Let's well, hopefully. That. There's been a stack of rain in Queensland. So let's hope he's getting a tan. Getting rain down. I don't know what the weather's holiday. like now. But <laughs> Hi, Michael. We're not praying for rain for you. We're praying for sun. <laughs> G'day, mate. Um, all right, guys. Let's get into it. So today what I want to kind of quiz you both about a little bit is um, – the market outlook for first home buyers in 2024. I feel like it's, I've been seeing a lot of news stories over the last couple of weeks, um, which tends to happen at the start of a year because everyone is, you know, making predictions about what we're going to see happen this year across sort of, you know, all industries and property is, is very much included in that. Um, and something that I have seen pop up a lot is these predictions that 2024 is not going to be a great year for first home buyers. Um, Jace, you actually mentioned in, in a previous, a few episodes ago that, you know, in 2022, we saw a lot of first home buyer activity. Yeah, that's right. And we saw that trend drop off dramatically last year, um, because of a lot of factors. And basically the experts are saying that, unfortunately, we're probably going to see much of the same thing continue this year, especially for first home buyers. Um, so I guess what I want to do is, is yeah, look at some articles that, that we've read in the last week. Um, unpack some of these challenges that first home buyers are facing, will continue to face. And I would love if we could end on a positive note, maybe with some, you know, solutions, actions, um, and just, you know, advice, I guess, general advice for anyone that is a first timer trying to get into the property market this year. Yeah. Um, as our listeners would know, I I'm trying to get into the property market <laughs> this year. So um, I guess this is a little greedy of me because I'm really hoping to take a lot from this chat today um, and yeah, kick off, kick off my property journey. So let's start. Um, so the, the first article that um, popped up was in, shared in the SMH um, and it was headlined, what are the chances of buying a home in 2024? Um, in this article, they spoke about, you know, first home buyers are going to struggle, continue to struggle with rising prices, high interest rates and inflation as pretty big barriers to entry. Um, the article sort of cited that there might be some relief this year as property price growth is tipped to slow down a little bit. Supply, hopefully, will increase and interest rates um you know, everyone is kind of predicting that maybe towards the mid later half of the year, um, interest rates will start to drop off. And then there's also things like the um, shared equity scheme, which we've talked about a bit recently, um, which is expected to help buyers get into the market as well. But I think over overall, the article alluded to, you know, the outlook is still pretty grim. Um, there's still a lot of challenges that first home buyers um, are facing. So taking all that in, um, I guess, you know, and based on what we're seeing in the market, um, I'm, I'm keen to know, you know, what you guys think um, and if you kind of agree with these sentiments that, you know, 2024 is going to be a, a tough year um, for first home buyers, if, if you sort of think that there's going to be a shift um, and if, if, you know, we're, we're going to see much of the same of, of what we saw last year um, is where I'd like to start. Yeah, look, I'll probably go first. Um this, this is a great topic, and I think it's uh, it's it's a topic that you see in the media all the time, yep. mm. right? Absolutely. And there's a lot of repeat sort of um, information around that too. 
Yep. And what I find interesting is what you're talking about in that article where they quote that oh, it might be a little bit better or some reprieve because uh, there's a slower growth in property prices. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like... <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. so, so even if there's a slower growth in property prices, if if last year you found affordability challenging, yeah. the, the, the prices are still going up, right? Mm. They're just going up slower, yeah. but it, it's still not in propor uh, proportion to, say, wage growth. Yeah. Right, yeah. and then you hammered as a first home buyer by reduced borrowing capacity because of where the interest rates are at. Right, and interest rates aren't going to go down uh, very quickly or go down significantly, which means we normally have the effect of giving you greater borrowing capacity. Mm. Inflation is still there; it's gone a bit better. Rents still expensive, so I think mm. all the factors are still the same. Yeah. It's that it's affecting your ability to save because the cost of living pressures are higher, you have lower borrowing capacity compared to before the interest rate started increasing. So on, on average, about 30, 40%. Mm. Mm. So if you combine these two and prices are growing slower, <laughs> it's pretty tough environment, I think, for 2024. Oh, I find that yeah. really interesting as well. That It's not that property is going to go down. It's still yeah, growing. That's yeah. right. But it's just a slower growth rate. Correct. <laughs> but it's so... The goalposts are still moving away, yeah. But they're just moving away slower. In fact, it's you know it's more painful because they're still moving away from you, yeah. But just a much slower rate. Mm. So, um, it, it is. I, I think we are heading into a bit more positivity, but I think it's going to be still very tough. As Jace mentioned, you know, rising interest rates are going to still be a massive problem uh, for first home buyers trying to crack the market from the affordability point of view, i.e., being able to get the loan to, to purchase that property and be able to afford the, the mortgage repayments, I think that's still going to be very tough. Yeah. And it's compounded by property still growing at a smaller rate, but it's compounded by those factors. Um, I also think that uh, inflation is coming down and we will see some interest rate reprise at some stage. You see, again, we're, we're talking that August, September, yeah. sort of back end of, of 2024. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But... <laughs> You know, we say that interest rates coming down, but that's just going to increase the pool of people that can afford to purchase property. And it's therefore going to mean that, you know, if there were 20 people going to that open home, there might be 24 people now that are able to purchase that same property that you want to purchase. Yeah. So although the prices are not rising as fast as they are, interest rates may come down. It means that more people can afford those same properties that you're looking at. Right. So therefore it makes the competition for those same properties that you're looking at mm. more difficult. So there's more volume of people looking yep. to purchase that same property that you are. Well, and and what we have, well, what I have learned along the course of this podcast so far is that if it's more competitive, there's yes. more demand, and if we don't see a shift in supply, then that is also bad news for people that are trying to buy supply, because there's yeah demand. now more people that are in that pool that that can be competitive um, with purchasing. 100%. Going back to mm. Michael's analogy of the, of the bananas yeah. in, in episode one, right? There's it's like 100 bananas, 50 bananas. It, 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 the demand is increasing for bananas, i.e. property. Yeah. So if the demand is increasing, then that's ultimately going to push up prices. And falling interest rates will help increase the demand for property. That's just a no-brainer. That That's going to happen mm. if, if interest rates fall. That's right. Especially on the confidence side, I think, is that uh, in a rising interest rate environment, not necessarily it means that people can't afford or have the borrowing capacity because everyone's yeah. situation is different. You, yeah. you still have a lot of first home buyers that are earning really good income. But I think when interest rates are increasing, it affects their confidence yeah. right, in the stability and the outlook of what's going to happen in the future. Mm. So for example, I think when the rates were increasing uh, back then, you might have a first home buyer that's able to obtain the loan that they need, but they'll put off on their decision on buying a property because they're not sure what it's going to look like in the next five years mm. if interest rates at the moment are increasing every single month. Correct. Is, yeah. is it going to go all the way up to 9%? Yes, I can afford it at the moment. Let's say the interest rate is 5% or has increased. Yeah. But that uncertainty um, you know, can dampen the demand. Yeah. But if you've got mm. that certainty or confidence of rates actually they're going always. down or they're going to stay, then that's going to trigger more you demand. you the confidence to actually pull the trigger and, that's and right. get into the property market. And that's going to increase the demand for the same amount of supply because there's yeah. not as much supply coming yeah. onto the market, right? That's that's definitely been a factor for me, you know, personally, is like as someone who, um, you know, loves to have all the information and does, I'm, I'm pretty risk averse, mm. um, I would say. Uh, so, yeah, when you, you know, because I work in this space and I like live in this space, um, seeing 
all these predictions, all these like clickbaity, these scary headlines that talk about, you know, interest rates or, um, you know, I read about uh, people who just came off fixed rate mortgages and, and, and how fixed rate loans and how they're, you know, struggling, grappling with repayments yep. makes me go, oh, I don't know if I want to take that on. You don't know <laughs> like if it's for it's, you. Yeah, it's a scary, scary thing to think about. But yeah, I suppose that that's strangely enough something I hadn't thought about, Chris, what you were saying of, you know, if, if interest rates do come down, then obviously more people such yeah. as myself will, will feel more confident and will be getting into the market, which means... I'm going to be up against a lot more people when I go to those auctions. Yeah, the competition <laughs> increases, 100%. The yeah. competition increases because everyone can afford mm. those same properties that you can now afford yeah. because the mortgage or the interest rates have come down. Yeah. Your affordability is higher. You can afford to have higher repayments mm. yeah. if you want to, or you can afford to spend more on a property. So yeah. those properties that were out of reach six months ago because of interest rates, they're mm. now in reach, but that's the same situation for everyone. So you've now got 20 yeah. to 50 people coming to, to auctions where there was less. So you've got 10 to 20% more coming to those same mm. auctions or those same open homes yeah. because now people can afford those same properties that you can. Because and, the interest rates yeah, and down. that's exactly what happened after COVID because right. we had that boom. Weren't they supposed to go down 30%? Yeah, well, exactly yeah, right. What, yeah. It was 30%, <laughs> then it was 20-something percent. Down then, as and, in wet house prices? Yeah, I, I remember seeing that. COVID. Yeah, some that's the, right. Yeah, like right. some of the bank economists were quoting that, yeah. that they're forecasting that property prices will fall by 30%. Wow. And then they revised it to, say, 14%. Then they revised it to an increase. Oh, my god! And then we saw a massive uplift and boom, say, around, um, I think it was November, October, September 2020, uh, 2021. Yeah. And that's where things started all happen. I think it was, yeah, 2020 or 2021 mm. that we all got out of COVID and people had all that money saved up. Pent up demand. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and there was FOMO. Rates were really low, like yep. exactly like what you're saying. All-time lows. 2%, 2.5%, more borrowing capacity, more affordable, people more willing to pay premium above the reserve. Yeah. And that's where set these records and really uh, high auction clearance rates. That, that pushed up all the demand. And then it only slowed down when the rates started going up. Which is crazy to think because when rates were 2.5%, property prices during COVID didn't do what we thought they were going to do. They went nuts after mm. COVID. But then rates have now gone up, what, 400 points since, so 4% 4 basically since. Yeah. And we've now seen property go back to the highs, if not above, I believe, from the core logic data, mm. higher than the highs that we saw after COVID. So... The interest rates haven't had the effect of bringing property prices down. Yeah. But when interest rates come down, it will have the effect of bringing property prices up because of the affordability side of things. And then we, you've talked mm. on, as well as that, about those clickbaity headlines. Mm. You know, again, seeing 30% property prices going to go down 30% during COVID. Seeing interest rates are not going to move until 2024. I, I remember those headlines very clearly <laughs> uh, that, you know, interest rates aren't going to go up. Um, until 2024 mm. and, and as I think Michael said in a previous podcast you know here we are sitting uh, where interest rates have gone up 400 points or 13 rate rises mm. um, you know so, so those clickbaity headlines or even some of the forecasts that you know some of the experts have, have put out there have come really unstuck so it is very difficult to, to see through the bullshit let's call it yeah. um, and, and make those decisions about should you purchase now or should you hold off? It is very difficult because there is so much noise out there. Yeah. Um, what's the answer to that? I mean, that, that's a hard answer to, but I think you've really got to try and just see through the noise and have a long-term plan and, and execute on the long-term plan, yeah. which is trying to keep that property for as long mm. as you can. I, I think so too. I think, yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know this from experience because I totally can't do this, but like having that long-term view, being able to kind of, even just thinking back to COVID a couple of years ago and like the trends and things that we saw come off the back of that, like being able to identify those patterns and maybe, you know, there's no crystal ball, but like use that previous data to kind of predict what we might see. And I suppose it's another thing I hadn't thought about. If interest rates go down, house prices are going to go up, aren't they? Because people can be more competitive Correct. and people can potentially pay more because they're even just that psychological thing of like, if you've been dealing with, higher interest rates and um, you haven't been able to, you know, potentially borrow as much or spend as much. And then when that drops off, I can imagine I'd probably be like, oh, let's go for it. I'm going to spend a little bit more on that house because yeah. because I can now or I've waited so long to be able to do this. Let's do it. You and, know? and you probably even have homeowners that may have been feeling the pinch from some of the high interest rates. If they start seeing 
interest rates coming down, they might think, okay, well, hold on, I can hang on here. And they may not bring their properties to market, which mm -hmm. then reduces the available listings. But the demand is still elevating. But the available listings is coming down because people are saying, well, interest rates are on the way down. I can afford to hold on here. Because mm -hmm. yeah. rents, historically, rents won't come back. Won't, rents won't follow to come back down. Rents will stay high because of the demand side. So the rents will stay mm -hmm. elevated, but then landlords' costs will start coming down. They may not decide to sell that property. So then you've got listings coming down, but the demand increasing. People's capacity to be able to make mortgage repayments and affordability becomes easier, I suppose, and they can afford to spend more. So it's a, a really double whammy um, on the property side mm. for people trying to get in. Yeah. May not be the positivity you wanted to hear. We'll but get to it. We'll get to it. I'm so positive that we'll get yeah. to something positive. We have to because, <laughs> I mean, we've like these situations have played out before, right, in history. I mean, not COVID, I guess. That was kind of a new one. Yeah. But everything is like cyclical. It's, it's all, yes. you know, things that are happening now um, in a way have happened before. I'm getting very philosophical. But, um, you know, this isn't the first time that first home buyers have found it hard to get into the property market. Maybe it is particularly hard right now and there's new challenges and there's, you know, new things that we're dealing with. But everything happens in a, in a cycle. Everything's cyclical. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about that one. No? Uh, especially when it's Argue for, with me first because home I just buyers went like, because, wow. yeah, I, th I think I can't remember the statistics, yeah. but, but the ownership rate by age group is reducing. Yeah. Mm. Right. So, yeah, 20, 30 years ago, the age group, let's say, you know, people in their 20, 20 uh, say 25 to 35. Yeah. You had a bigger proportion of people in that age group that were homeowners, homes. first homeowners, mm. right? Versus today. And I think this is a trend that's not going to come back. I, I can't see how yeah. 20 years in the future, you're going to then have more first homeowners at a younger age. I just think that age is just going to, you know, unless something significant happens, there, there's a massive influx of supply. There's there's massive government yeah. policy change. Population. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's the trend seems like, you know, on, on a very long term. Yeah. Um, that 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 first homeowners are getting older and older. Yeah. Um, there's less people owning their first home while they're younger. Mm. Right. So that is really really interesting to know. Yeah. yeah it would take something big to shift that yeah because right? what and, we're and talking about be, now you know yeah you know around the factors of interest rates cost of living mm. harder to save for deposit lack of wage growth yes unless mm -hmm. these things really change significantly and mainly i think the biggest thing is supply i can't see how how my kids yeah are going to be able to say without any of my support yeah are going to be able to buy or own a home younger than i was able to own a home. Mm. That, no, that's that's super interesting. Yeah. And, and Unless, again, we've, yeah. we've um, I, I think that's actually talking about, yeah, what the situation is now and hypothesizing about what it might look like. I think that's actually quite a good segue to another piece that I want to talk about um, because it does relate to a real, you know, first home buyer story um, that, that's happening right now, what the situation is now and, you know, how hard it is. Um, and that's such an interesting point, Jace, of like, you know, it. I, I like to try and be positive and, you know, think that like, it can't always be this tough, but you're right. Like this, this, it is data, it is trends and like all the data points to it moving in a certain direction. Um, but anyways, let, let's get into to this story. So um, this was something I read in the AFR. Um, I hadn't actually seen this series before, but now I'm like a big fan of it. <laughs> um, it's called How I Bought It. I don't know if you guys had seen those stories before. Yeah, Chris is not. No, is that no. always on property or is it, uh, is oh, it how I good, bought? I think it's it, always it, property. It's always property, but don't right? don't quote, I'll check. Okay, yeah. I've read the most recent couple and they're yep. all property. Mm. Um, I think they do one a month. But anyways, it, I, I saw this one and the reason why I saw it is because it actually popped up on my Facebook, Yeah. Um, which is strange because I don't follow the algorithm anyways. Um, but they had a lot of comments on it. So that kind of piqued my interest. But... I'll give you the top line. Um, so young, Ad Ad young Adelaide couple, apologies, um, purchased their first home. So the first home buyers, um, in the article, it's sort of, you know, I think it's the um, male in the couple that is, you know, telling the story of, of how they bought this home together. Uh, so the parents um, went guarantor yep. and they also provided the deposit for the property and 
um, that was, you know, that enabled them to make yeah. the purchase, which is yeah. a lot of help to receive. Yes. Um, the property price was around, I think, 900 900,000, um, which they did mention in the article was above their budget by about 100,000. Um, and then towards the end of the article, you know, they talk about the fact that they're, they're not actually planning on living in the home anytime soon because they're quite stressed out about um, the size of their mortgage repayments. they paid extra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they went over their budget. Um, and so they'll continue to live with the parents um, and rent out the property and, you know, obviously save on, on rent while they're um, paying, you know, their yep. mortgage on their home. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of you know very top line of the story, and there were a lot of um, comments on the Facebook post, which I mean, Facebook is just like the pit of the internet. I feel sometimes <laughs> you get you get all sorts. Yeah, so everyone comes it's out. Pretty funny. Straight to the comments, right? Yeah. When you see a story like the comments that, comments are better than the articles. Straight to the oh, comments. Hundred percent. Don't even read the article. Just go to the comments. Yeah, I know. And honest, I like. I'm not like. I hate that I always have to talk about the Facebook comments, but I have to because they're just ridiculous and so entertaining. That's what the people are thinking, right? Like they're. Well, that's true. It resonates. That's true. I think there's a lot of like keyboard warrior stuff. That, yeah. You know, you would just never say to someone. You got to shift through that. Yeah. You look through that stuff, but there were some real good nuggets of wisdom, I guess. We'll call it that. Or anger. Whatever. Yeah. Well, and but I think that's the thing. It does reflect a lot of different viewpoints. And I think one thing I feel like most people on Facebook are from a slightly older age demographic. Yeah. Um, we know that from data. That's fine to say. Um, my dad is Facebook's biggest fan. So <laughs> if, that's, if that's anything to go by, if that's your Facebook user, then oh, saying God. a lot. Um, but no, some of these comments that I thought were really, you know, like worth repeating. Um, one of them. This is an intergenerational tragedy. I thought, <laughs> that hit. Um, this other one, I love how the gifted deposit of 120 to 150K from the parents helped the process a little bit um, with a laugh yeah. emoji. Because, yeah, that, that was what he said in the They article. got slammed for that. I, I read the oh. article. He goes, yeah, we had a, we had a little bit of help. guarantee. I think it was between 120 grand and 150. Yeah. Years. That helped us a little bit. And they just latched onto that and just slammed slammed it. And saying. it's funny he wasn't exactly sure how much it was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like <laughs> yeah, so was around, around there. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, dude, you know, surely. <laughs> if you're liking what you're hearing so far and you want to check out more, make sure you're following Property Now because we share exclusive behind the scenes insights and other bits that don't make it into the full episode. This one, which was this was sounded this is an academic or something for sure, or they know how to use a thesaurus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Australian housing situation is one of the greatest bipartisan public policy blunders in the history of political science. Mm. Hey, pretty true. It yeah. is true. Yeah. Pretty yeah, I mean, true. We talked about this. Good, good comment. Yeah. Good comment. Great comment. Yeah, very true. Um, and then this other one, which I thought, yeah, was just sort of, you know, reflecting the, the frustrations or maybe the fear for this couple. Um Mid twenties and almost a million in mortgage debt. You need some exceptional circumstances to take that on, like a high combined income that'll continue if you start a family and or financial support from family. So a lot of mixed comments. Um, I feel like a lot of it was kind of either a combo of like quite critical and and you know towards the couple, which I I don't think there's really a place or a need for that. Um, but the ones that kind of you know talk more about the um, Australian housing policy and, and those sorts of things really reflect, you know, the sign of the times, um, the times that we're in right now. So, yeah, I guess, you know, there's a lot to unpack in that article. Um, I think the the piece about the guarantor loan um, is quite interesting because another thing that popped up in the, the comments a lot was uh, people advising against guarantor loans. And I didn't really understand. I don't know too much about how they work. I mean, I get yeah. that it's, you know, someone basically saying if all, if all of this goes yeah. downhill, then I am responsible, whatever that, I mean, that's my very uneducated way of explaining yep. it. So maybe that's a good place to start. And Jace, I'm looking at you as, as Mr. Mortgage Man, mm. um, just to kind of, yeah, understand, you know, what, like what a guarantor loan is, how it works for yep. the top line, but also like, why would people be saying, oh, uh, stay away. It's yeah, yeah, stay away. And, and is that something you, you that first-time buyers maybe should yep. be going against? Or yeah, you? sure. So firstly, guarantor loans, the purpose and the benefit is to help the borrowers avoid paying mortgage uh, lenders' mortgage insurance. Okay. Right. So you pay lenders' mortgage insurance whenever you need to borrow more than 80% of the property value. 
Yep. So let's say you're buying a million dollar property. If you need to borrow 850,000, you're paying lenders mortgage insurance. Yep. It's a once off premium, could be 10 grand, 15 grand, 20 grand, whatever it is, gets added to your loan. So even though it's a once off, um, you're actually paying interest on that because you would have, mm. without lenders mortgage insurance, you your loan would be 850K. Mm. With lenders mortgage insurance, because you don't have to pay that out of your own pocket, it gets added to your loan. Yep. Oh. Your loan ends up being, let's say, 860K. So it's yeah, an extra ten thousand dollars on your loan. So even though it's a once off, you're still paying a interest on interest that. on that amount. Oh, and you can't Correct. you can't choose to pay it up front. You can't. It, yeah. it Unle- gets added the to the only loan. way you, you choose to avoid balance. it yeah. Yeah, is okay. to come up with a twenty percent deposit. So that's where the twenty percent deposit always gets thrown around in the media. Okay. Uh, that you don't actually need a twenty percent deposit, yeah. but it's always the recommendation. Okay. To that's, avoid. For, that's for the mortgage insurance. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So if you get a guarantor, it just means. You will borrow eight hundred thousand against the property, but you know how you need it eight hundred and fifty. Mm. Where does that fifty k come from? It gets secured or supported by the guarantor's property. Mm. So the guarantor doesn't actually um, guarantee your entire loan. So if I'm I'm the guarantor to my kids for a loan of eight hundred fifty k, I'm not on the hook for eight hundred and fifty k. Yep, I'm only on the hook gotcha. for fifty k. Okay, because the other eight hundred k is against the property they're buying, which is a million bucks. Yeah. Right. So in the event the property price comes down and crashes, like some of the comments I always see on Facebook, just wait for the 40% crash, the bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it does happen and the bank sells the property because you can't pay your loan, mm. you know, after they sell the property, uh, they can't pay off the debt that you have because you borrowed a lot more. Yep. You borrowed 850 instead of 800,000. Mm. Then they can come after the guarantor for that 50 grand for that difference. Which is usually secured against. Their correct, property, correct. Their so the guarantor's right. property is on the line for that fifty grand difference. So yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. So mm-hmm. I, when I, everyone knows when I bought my first property, I yeah. had a guarantor loan as well. So mm-hmm. I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the guarantor loans, and I'll yeah. go into why people are against them. Yeah, okay. Um, but again, I bought my property for three hundred thousand. Apologies, everyone. It's three hundred thousand. <laughs> I know it's not that. It's a long it time, time ago. It right? should be a shame. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, three hundred grand, and I had uh, the twenty percent. Um, as a guarantor loan. So what's that? 60,000, which was secured against my parents' property and that property. Yeah. Um, and they went as guarantors. But then I had a second loan or the main loan, which was against that original house for 240 odd thousand. So there was, you know, in my net bank, um, I had two loans I could see there, which was 240 and 60, borrowed a hundred percent, but had 20% of the loan, which was secured against the parents' property, which helped yeah. avoid um, the LMI yeah. situation. Mm. So you had those, those two loans. Yeah. Um, it, it's effective because you can get into the property faster. If you, so it's, I used it for two reasons. I didn't have the deposit. Yeah. And then I thought, well, and the advice from Carol at the time, the our famous banker, <laughs> um, she said, well, why don't you do this? So you can also avoid LMI. So it was two prong benefits for myself. Yeah. yeah um, but exactly. there are risks that, that happen, right? So if at the time I was single, but if I had got married and then got into some uh, marriage dramas, mm. There is a, a loan on my parents' property, for example. So then that becomes a bit of an issue. Uh, if we had to sell that property and there, there was a shortfall, then there's a, a shortfall on the loan, for example. Yeah. On the parents' property, then how do we... Oh, is that because, like, are you saying... If we it, split. If you're married example, and then yeah. you have to divide as a married Correct, couple. A married couple. Yeah, yeah, Correct. gotcha. And okay. the marital assets. Yeah. And there's a loan there and it becomes oh. a bit a bit tricky there. Yeah. Have you seen scenarios like that play out? Uh, I have. I have. So fortunately, because that's only an issue if the property that you end up selling it is not enough to pay off the loan, Mm. right? And that's always the risk is because in your case, you borrowed 100% of the property value or what what you pay for the property. The the reason the banks only like to lend you 80% or 70% of the property value is so they have a buffer that should something happen, they need to sell your property, you can't pay the loan or you need to sell your property yourself. There's a guarantee or a very good chance the debt can be paid out. But when you're borrowing 100%, so if you bought it for a, for a million bucks, if you can only sell it for nine hundred thousand, look, and that happens, right? Just depends on p- particular property, Absolutely. particular area. If you pay too much for the property, correct, yeah. mm. and then you want, and you're separating, you need to sell it. It's only able to be sold for nine hundred thousand. After you pay off the loan, you still owe a hundred grand to the bank. Then that becomes a complicated. The banks issue. don't want to lose, right? They want to have definitely. That's why they have the eighty percent. Usually, the buffer. correct. They have the mortgage insurance and. 
they want that second security. If you're going to do a guarantor loan, they need that second security. That's right. That's right. And, and some of the other issues could be the parents or you may have siblings. Mm. But what about when your sibling wants to yeah. use a guarantee? So you have to think about that. Or what about the plans of the parents? Because sometimes the conversation isn't detailed enough on the yeah. long-term plans or what the parents want to do. They mm. may want to sell and yeah. downsize and see change or this and that. So but if, if the parents sell, what happens in that scenario? Because my understanding as well, there's, a, there's an actual loan on the parent's property. Yeah, correct. So if they decide to sell. Oh, they have to pay, it out, pay out that debt. So they've effectively given you cash. Yeah. So if you still owe that portion let's say you know the example we're using is the 50k mm. and your parent the parents or the guarantor actually sold the property so the bank has to release that security then they have then to pay down the out. debt so that's where the issues arise so let's use a proper example in today's market it's yeah. a, million, a million dollar property yeah uh, your parents go guarantor for that 20 percent, so 200k mm. it, so you've got a loan in your name for 800,000 and for 200 but if they decide to sell their property that 200,000 gets paid off the issues arise then if you were to get divorced for example then yep. there's that 200,000 equity now that becomes an issue right um, for the marital assets because that's now seen as equity but really your parents have paid that off via them selling the property mm. that's exactly right. and that's a similar thing that's when, when the issues come in place career gotcha. when in like your story when parents provide a gift or provide cash yeah so in addition to being guarantors in this particular story they also gave them money gave them cash for the deposit right. so if Helped you give them bit, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you give them money that's the same issue right so when the property is sold do you then give the money back to the parents yeah, so right. that's why you got to have an agreement you got to yeah. have a conversation but nobody wants to have that conversation right well i guess you you never think <laughs> during you that want time if, yeah. at, the, at the time the couple is really happy want to buy a You're property excited. and the first thing you bring up is when you separate <laughs> i want well, my the, money back yeah. most parents want to see their kids get ahead <laughs> yeah. and they want to help yeah i don't i don't think they see they can foresee some of these issues that that's happen. right i mm. mean at the end of the day a lot of the time you think you can get the guarantor loan removed in three, four, five, ten years, whatever that is. But sometimes it, it can go for a lot longer. Take longer. It can yeah. take longer. So then what do you do in that scenario? So I think, as Jason mentioned, if other siblings wanted to do the same thing, then they can't because there's already the guarantor loan on there unless they refinance the whole thing, I, I right. believe. So then the other siblings miss out or they parents may not be able to help those Correct. siblings at all. Correct. Yeah. Again, marital issues or they want the, to sell the property. Yeah, the parents it limits them use the equity for you. Correct. It's not like they have unlimited equity. No. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I guess, and it all those you know you think about all those emotions involved, and like it, you, I understand, I guess, why people, especially if maybe they've had a bad experience with yeah. it themselves, or they've seen you know divorce or other things like that 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 do happen a lot. Yeah. Um, then you would have that negative experience and and advise against it. But yeah. I guess what like would the important advice be, you know, if you're a first home buyer that is consider considering a guarantor loan to just even though it might be uncomfortable, even though you're in that love bubble or you're taking this exciting step, think about the stuff that could go wrong. Not to say you're planning to get divorced, but to, yeah. to or, you know, if you're still single, whatever. Um, but, you know, planning for what could happen and really like having it in writing. And, and would you, would you like actually get legal advice? Like this has to yeah, be like definitely. a proper legal yes. document. Definitely. And, yeah. yeah. Yes. Most of the time. It's not a verbal agreement between no. mum and dad. And well, the... I think most of them are, right? <laughs> yeah. Then, which like so, I, scary. I think the big thing is I'm a, I'm a big fan of the guarantor loans if they're done right. So I think yeah. Jace, you're probably going to mention the legal advice side of things. Mm. But I think talk to your broker, talk to the banker, and also get some legal advice as to what the implications are. Mm. Yeah, it's all about understanding, like you said, the implications, understanding the ins and outs. Yeah, and not assuming oh guarantor loans are bad, they're risky, so I'm not going to talk to my parents about it or this is a topic I won't explore. Mm. Right, find out about it. It may be suitable or may not be suitable and bring up the conversation yeah. because your parents or whoever's going as guarantor may have other plans too. Yeah. But lay it out on the table, have a discussion and then at the end of it, it might be suitable. At the end of it, it might not be suitable. And if it's not, there are other avenues as well. It's totally. not as if the only thing you can do to avoid lender's mortgage insurance is using the guarantor loan. Yeah. Uh, it's especially, you know, I think we'll talk. We'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this later. But yeah. some of the other government schemes available to help first home buyers, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is also for the same benefit of having a lower deposit and avoiding LMI. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think we'll definitely get into that in a sec. I guess the the one like sort of final thing that jumped out to me from this article was the fact that you know, 
even with this little bit of help, and I'm using inverted comma, commas because I would consider having parents go guarantor and receiving the full deposit in cash as a massive amount of help. Yeah. Um, and no judgment. Hey, if your parents can do that for you, that's for incredible. It. Take the help you can get. Um, but even with that help, they still can't move into their dream home. They're still living with the parents because they can't afford the they mortgage. They had to pay extra for the property. They had to pay extra for the property, um, which, you know, again, they're very lucky to be in a situation where they can live with their, their parents and they have that support as well. But it just made me go, shit, even with all that help, they still can't oh, like, I don't know, but the isn't, home. That to me seems like because they got that help, yeah. they became more confident. Mm. And because they became more confident, they were more willing to yeah. go above what the original budget was. Yeah. And they bought the property. But it sounds like as well, without that help, they're never going to buy. Yeah. By the sounds of, like they had, what was it, 150 grand. Um, it, whether it was a cash um, mm. don't, well, donation, what do you yeah. mean? Cash yeah, gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if it was a guarantor loan. They still had that 150 grand leg up, which yeah. again, I completely encourage if parents can help out, like do it, get the advice. Totally. Uh, but maybe they wouldn't have been able to purchase without having that help at all, yeah. which is what it sounds like from the article, which is another problem. Yeah. But the, there's two avenues that parents can help there. So the first one is the, the guarantor loan or, or cash donation or cash gift. But the second part is like, and, and this may be an unpopular opinion, but there's such a rush for people to, when they hit 18, that they want to move out of home, be independent and yeah. start like, I'm, I'm actually quite against that. If you, you know, stay at home as long as you can and, mm. and get those financial benefits. And if your parents are, if you come from a good household and it's a great, like it's a great place to live, stay home and, and, and live there and save your, your money as much yeah. as you can. We, we did a podcast a couple of weeks back about the empty bedrooms. Yeah. Um, speak to your parents about staying for a little bit longer. Mm. Speak to your grandparents, or the boomers, right? That have all these empty bedrooms. Speak to them about staying there totally. for a year or two and, and save some extra money. Like, it's such a huge leg up where if you can say, what, what's the average rent now? Six, 700 bucks a week. Yeah. yeah. Call it even number 500 bucks a week. That's, yeah. yeah. You know, call it 25 to 30 grand a year extra that you could save. That's unbelievable. It's if you do money. that for two or three yeah. years, right, Massive just saving that rental amount, living with mum and dad or living with the grandparents, if you have the luxury to do so. Yeah. I, I, that's another strategy where I think kids should implement or the parents should encourage yeah. that the kids stay stay there for a bit longer stay at the age of 18 and mm. 21 22 usually the age of 18 to, to 21 is your lowest income point right you, you might be still studying um you've got a low income point like stay i encourage people to stay home as long as possible yeah absolutely. and save as much as you can like yeah, yeah. use that yeah i was that's pretty, the best way i was pretty quick to move out like as soon as i could and yeah. my partner did the opposite like lived lived at home until we moved out together a couple of years ago um, and the difference between, you know, the, our financial situations going into the relationship was huge because mm. I had been, yeah, in those lower income phases of my life, paying rent and, you know, bills and, You're probably, and paying rent. And You're probably a, not cooking either. You're probably like going out like that's Yeah, the, probably. I, it feels like, like a so it's, memory. and I'm not saying that that's for everyone, right? But yeah. I was fortunate enough to get both those jobs where I had the guarantor loan, but I was also able to mm. live at home. So they're, they're two huge benefits and yeah. fortunate to be able to have. Uh, but I saw it early on that, hey, if I do this and stay at home for an extra couple of years, you can, um, I'll be able to have that financial freedom where I am today. Yeah. And that's, I think, really, really important that, you know, we talk about the power of compounding interest, yeah. right? That's at the age of 18, 19, 20, 21, that's the power of compounding where if you do those little things mm. at those ages, it compounds to something massive in your 30s. That's very true. And you may not totally. be thinking about that now. Yeah. Being into the 30s, you think 30s is so far away. Yeah. Let me tell you, it comes quicker than you think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. It comes quicker than you think. Yeah. So plan for that and have that compounding mind that, hey, you know what? I am going to stay with mum and dad for a bit longer. I am going to move in with the grandparents. Yeah. Um, fill up those empty bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So true. I think, um, I think that's a great one. And it kind of like, you know, I said at the start, let's try and end on a positive. And I feel like this is heading in a positive direction. That's the so positive. I guess aside from that, say, um, you know, if, if you're a first home buyer and you, you don't have that option for whatever reason, um, you know, you, you don't have the financial support from parents or you don't have, you know, close relatives or, yep. or family that you can live with to kind of save what, and, and you want to get into the property market. What are, and JC mentioned it a little bit um, earlier, what are different sort of avenues for support, whether it's like government, um, initiatives, um, what are other things that first home buyers can look to, to maybe help them get a leg up um, in the current market? Yeah, I think the first one I would say 
is is speak to a mortgage broker or mm. a lender. So to really understand your current position, right? Because what, what I find is that because of these articles in the media and, and even the things we're talking about, yeah, they're very high level, they're all trends. Everyone's individual situation is different, yep. right? Yeah. Just like what you're talking about, Chris, staying at home might be for some people, not for others. So always work out, rather than just continue to doing your own research all the time, reading article after article yeah. and getting expert opinion, actually find out exactly what position you're at. There's only going to be- Personalized advice. Co correct, exactly. Yeah, in your sure. situation, where you're at now, mm. how far away are you from your goal and what is it that you need to focus on? Because there's only two things, right? There's either, it's a, either deposit issue or income borrowing capacity issue. That's the two. Right, you don't have enough deposit, but you can borrow a lot of money. You can't buy something. Mm. Yeah, you have a lot of income, but you have no deposit. Yep. you can't buy something. Right, so you usually have one or the two or the other. Right, and you focus on if it's a deposit issue, you don't have enough deposit. You've got a really healthy income, then you're very clear. Okay, my deposit is the problem. Mm. So I'm going to focus on strategies on my deposit. Then I'm going to look at government schemes on how do I buy a home with a low deposit, mm. uh, at ways to buy a home with a low deposit, methods, you know, is there anything in the market that can help me get into the market as soon as possible? <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? This is not scripted. <laughs> no, it's amazing. So for someone else, it could be, I've got a great deposit, I've got yeah. parents as guarantors, I've got this, but my income isn't at the level I need it to be because of the high interest rates and my borrowing cash capacity is taking a hit by 30%. Yeah. So just go get a second and third job. Potentially. <laughs> potentially. Or, or, work, th work three full-time jobs. Yeah. yeah. There's enough hours in There's the day. There's 24 right? hours in a day. Uh, that makes sense. We've least, all got the same 24 hours. But at to least you're going to be really clear with where you're at. And it's not going to be yeah. you know, just guesses. Oh, I don't think I'm, I'll be able to get a home. Yeah. Or So you know exactly where your weakness is and then you focus on that. That was like so beautiful and so simple. Like that really clicked something in my head where it's like you've either got this problem or this problem yep. and focus on the strategies and the solutions that can help address whatever the problem is that you are facing. 100%. That's that's exactly yeah. right because I'll speak to customers and, and, and they may want some, some little bit of information because they're sort of testing the waters, mm. but they don't want to commit to have a conversation so we can identify what the issue is. And they may not know what the issue is. So Correct. So speak to someone yeah. that's qualified to you. say, hey, this is actually the issue. It's the income is the problem or it's your deposit is an issue. Here's five things that you can do to either increase your deposit or here's some government schemes that can work for you to have a higher deposit or get in with a lower deposit, right? Yeah, That's so, right. And in your story actually talks about, oh, we didn't think we could buy a property or something, right? Yeah. After we spoke to someone, like, yeah, a, pro yeah. like a professional, and then we realized we could. And they could. Yeah. So Above their budget. I didn't know well. about guarantor loans until I spoke to my, bank, my banker at yeah. the time. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. I was able to buy because of that new you know, hack that I thought at the time was a hack that got unlocked for me. So mm. yeah, speak to the professionals and, and see are there things out there that can help you get in. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So in addition to that, you know, mm. there's the obvious government um, assistance for first home buyers around helping them with a lower deposit. Yep. Um, we, we talked about the help to buy the shared equity. That's actually a federal scheme yep. that's waiting to be approved. Yep. But there's actually state-based schemes for that. So mm. for example, in New South Wales, there's actually already shared equity help to buy for essential workers. Yeah. Uh, so so, so like that'll solve the problem. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think teachers, nurses, teachers, yep. police officers. Yeah, okay. Um, and that'll potentially solve the problem if you can't borrow enough money mm. to do the shared equity. Or the government grant or low deposit can help you avoid LMI if you don't have a guarantor. Those are the things that's available. But rather than sometimes doing the research yourself and trying to figure all of it out and diagnose your own problem, like, you know, if I don't feel well, I'll go to WebMD instead of going to the GP. <laughs> I think there is a difference. Yeah. yeah. Because if you read a lot of stuff on the internet and we talked about it's clickbaity and this and that, you actually get more confused. Because well, you need to be personalized. Correct, to correct. Mm. That's right. So, so even with what we're talking about, oh, the outlook is bleak. But it not may it not necessarily be that case for for an individual, for, yeah. for, for everyone. I'll be, and not to open up a new topic, but I'll be really interested to see how those shared equity schemes go because I, I do think that there's some scepticism from, particularly in Australia, yeah. about owning property with government. But I'll be really, again, not opening up a new topic, but that yeah. could be something we discuss at a later point where, you know, do people actually want to own home with government? And I know it's big in the UK, yeah. uh, but... 
but also that'll links back to your point yeah. about supply and also because there's only 10,000 spots that's the proposal I don't mm. know how much macro it's a drop in the impact that's yeah, is that going to change the trend yeah. for 10,000 first home buyers yeah, I can't imagine we're going to see a big shift in past yeah. is it just for first home buyers uh, oh, I think uh, first home but I think or was it lower income See it could be, it could be means tested against income. Yeah, whatnot. yeah. It's uh, yeah. I think income. I think you could have owned a property, but it's got to be a long time. But you mm. can't own a property now. Okay. Yeah. I think there's still not a lot of information, like because I, I a lot of the and we've spoken about it now a couple of times recently, um, but a lot of the articles I feel like says a different, yeah. slightly conflicting thing yeah. about how it's going to work, yeah. and I guess until it's actually legislated yeah. Um, there, yeah. it is a bit of guesswork there hasn't been much news no. all the articles are from last year yeah yeah. like the latest one's from August yeah right Jeez. and yeah so un- until it's legislated a- anything could change watch this space watch but 10,000 spots space. and again the supply demand issue yeah yeah. more people can buy does that mean yeah but again 10,000 mm. I don't know <laughs> but circling back to some of my thoughts for first time buyers yeah I'm gonna, there's Lay two things. There's two things, and I'm going to do a shameless plug at the, for the second. It'd be one. rude but not to. For the first one is the government. <laughs> the government grants, like yeah. there are great government grants out there to be utilised, yeah. um, whether it's in New South Wales, Victoria, or Queensland, or any state, um, or, or there's federal government grants. L- speak to again your mortgage broker or advisor is probably mm. the best to tell you what grants are available. Use them. That's what they're there for. They give you a leg up. Like find out what there is available, whether it's a stamp duty exemption or it's a, if it's a new property, I think under 600, you get a $10,000 grant. Like use these, these grants. They were there when I was buying. I wasn't able to use them at the time, but my brother was able to use them. So use the grants yeah. that are available to you. That's what they're designed um, for. Yeah. Um, the second one is the deposit issue. I mean, we've created Coposit because of this deposit issue. Right? That's mm. primarily, we've seen in the market how difficult it is to save for a deposit. It takes anywhere from six to 10 years to save for that deposit, then you can purchase. Yeah. So, you know, what we do here at Coposit, obviously helping people get into property without that full deposit. I think that's something that we've identified in the market that is a huge problem. And we're trying to actually address that by the business that we all run and work towards to, to help people get into the market. And we see that on a daily basis, people yeah. are using it to reduce the barriers uh, for property entry and, and getting in with deposit on the deposit side of things yeah yeah that's right and i think with the things that we're talking about even in the beginning of oh, the price increases are slowing down it just tells me that the importance of getting into the market mm. getting your first property securing that first property is so much more important now than before yep. yeah like I, I can just think of a list of benefits around that you know for example if you're saving at the moment you pay tax on the interest you save mm. if you have a loan and you're saving interest on your loan, you don't pay tax. So, so there's all these things mm. that tells you that you got to get your foot in the door, that own that first property yeah. as soon as possible before the prices escape and they keep getting further and further yeah. away. The goalposts. Yeah. So I think keep. that's Ever the that, 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 that's the difference is how do you get onto the property ladder ASAP. Yeah. Rather than waiting, waiting, waiting for the right time mm. for the prices to collapse, for the bubble to burst, uh, and we've seen so many years of evidence around that. I've been saying that for 40, 50 years yeah, now. Yeah, mm. exactly right. Guys, that was amazing advice. We ended on a positive note. I didn't know if we, <laughs> we could found do it. it. We found the positive. We found it. We found the positive spin. That's what we do here. Um, I took a lot from that. And um, yeah, that was just a great, 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 great discussion. I think, you know, that point around while the, the media is saying the market outlook is bleak, I think that's such good advice, Jace, of like, yes, overall trends may be moving in a direction and the the big picture the um, might be kind of bleak, but understanding that that is just noise and focusing on your individual situation, getting advice um, and seeing, you know, looking at the different strategies, the different grants, schemes, companies such as ourself um, that exist that can help you kind of knock over that first domino exactly staying home with mum and dad yeah. yes absolutely or the grandparents that's a big one i think yeah. that hasn't been yeah. looked at yeah exactly um all right guys well another great app let's wrap it up there thanks as thanks as thank you as always great to be back <laughs> the property now podcast offers opinions on australian property news for informational and entertainment purposes only and they are general in nature it does not take into account your objectives financial situation or needs it does not constitute professional advice always seek expert guidance before making any property related decisions we're not the